Hi Dixons, I'm Helen Cates and I'm Director of English here at Dixons Brooklyn's Academy in Manchester. Thanks for watching this video. Please do subscribe to our channel, like, comment and share using the hashtag Dixons Open Source. At Dixons, we know that giving effective feedback that moves learning forward is key to ensuring our students have excellent attainment and make outstanding progress. This third video in our mini-series on whole class feedback will give an example of what feedback looks like in the classroom and how we adapt whole class feedback to suit our context here at Dixon's Brooklands. One of the first changes we made in our English department as we joined Dixon's was developing a model for whole class feedback. Previously, we had definitely fallen into the trap that Kate referred to in the first video in this series of using marking as a proxy for feedback. As a result, written marking had become time consuming, onerous and was having a limited impact. We knew that we needed to make a change to support both student progress and staff workload. And our starting point was Dylan Williams principles. Tasks should be planned to elicit useful information. Feedback needs to be well timed and driven by moving learning forwards. And that the focus should be on what students actually did with that feedback. We started by looking at what we were giving feedback on and applying the principle of less is more, establish common feedback points for each cycle. This ensures that we have points of comparison across cohorts and sets a minimum for the feedback students will receive across a cycle. It does not, however, limit staff to these points. Teachers use their professional judgment to provide feedback at other pertinent points across the cycle. Our next move was to agree as a team what we wanted feedback to look like. What elements did we as a team feel strongly about? What was going to work best for our students? And how would we embed those principles of effective feedback? As ever, the balance between consistency and autonomy was a line that had to be walked carefully. After much discussion, we agreed on five key elements for our feedback lesson. We start with misconceptions and a retrieval task in the form of a do now. We then address any common literacy errors and then we share what good looks like. This has been a key element for us in ensuring that students understand what we're aiming for and are consequently able to emulate this in their own work. The examples used here can either be from students in the class or can be created by the teacher. Let's have a look at what this looks like in the classroom. OK, moving on then from our literacy bit, we're going to have a look now at what good looks like. So if you just move down to task three on your sheet, we're going to have a look at an example that has come from Lexi and from Ella today. And the first thing I want you to do, just everything out of your hands, I just want you to follow along and read this one and start thinking about why might I have chosen this example. So in the extract, Shakespeare portrays Macbeth's fears as the consequences of his actions. He may have done this to warn the contemporary audience of the dangers of disrupting the natural order and reveal the importance of re resisting the temptation of the supernatural. He states that his fears in Banquo stick deep. The adjective deep creates the impression he has thought often about this and cannot get rid of the idea. It is resiliently immovable, much like Banquo himself, strong and lingering in both impression and presence. He goes on to compliment his royalty of nature continuing to point out his positive qualities. Though it is not unlikely that this is pure envy, the positive language may also exemplify that even someone who views Banquo as an enemy and an obstacle must admit his saint-like qualities. Okay, what I would like you to do now is look at the colour coding that I have given you on there, and I'm just going to give you 30 seconds on the timer. With nothing in your hands, we're not writing anything at the moment, I just want you to think for 30 seconds, what is it that I have picked out there? What makes this a good one? 30 seconds, off you go. Okay, stop there. You've now got an additional 30 seconds to turn to your shoulder partner. And I want you to agree, what does the orange represent? What does the blue represent? Off you go. Okay, five seconds and then a cold call coming. And stop there, please, and pick up your pen so that you can make these notes as we go through. So looking, first of all, at this orange one. 
So Shakespeare does this to warn the contemporary audience of the dangers of disrupting the natural order and reveal the importance of resisting the temptation of the supernatural. What is good about that sentence? Imogen. Right, absolutely brilliant. It highlights Shakespeare's message, certainly. What sort of words is it using in order to do that? Think about when we've looked at Inspector Calls, think about when we've looked at poetry. Georgina. Analytical verbs. Georgina, that's brilliant. So it's using those analytical verbs just like we have done in every other aspect of your literature exam. So we've got two key things there that we want to focus on. We are looking at Shakespeare's message and we're looking at layered analysis. And we've got two different types of language that we are going to try and use within those. What I would like you to do now, and I'm going to give you three and a half minutes for this, I want you to look back at your work from last lesson. And using your highlighters, just like we've done in this example one, I want you to highlight where you have done those things already in your writing. So highlight it and annotate it in your book. And then down this final column here, I want you to write yourself any targets or any reminders, anything you need to think about ready for next time. If you are stuck or you need a second opinion, pop your hand up. Otherwise, you've got three and a half minutes. I want to see what you can do with that. Off you go. Once we've established what we're aiming for, we give students specific and actionable next steps to move them from where they are towards the good example that we've just discussed. Ensuring that the next steps selected are high leverage and actionable is crucial in making this element effective. Let's look at that in action. Right, okay, so you should have a really clear idea now then of which bits of this you have already done and which bits it is you need to work on. So the next thing we are going to look at is our next steps and we're going to look at how we can get you from where you are now to somewhere closer to that example that we have just looked at. So if you look at task four at your next steps grid, you can see that I have given us two next steps that we're going to have a look at together today. So the first thing is we need to make sure that we are starting our paragraphs with a really clear thesis statement that includes one of those analytical verbs. The second one is that we need to be looking at that layered exploration of the writer's language choices. So we're going to work through each of those before you have a go at doing a bit of a redraft and showing me that you can act on those targets. So the first one then, I need a clear thesis statement, a clear argument or idea from you, which includes an analytical verb. Remind me what an analytical verb is. Give me an example of one, please, Luca. To reveal. Brilliant, to reveal. Another one, Rosie. To warn. To warn. Georgina. To illustrate. To illustrate. Don't suggest. Brilliant. So all of those action words that tell us what it was Shakespeare was trying to do, what he was trying to achieve. So in this scene, we are looking at Macbeth's realisation that he's basically terrified of Banquo. He is worried about the threat that Banquo poses to him and the stability of his power. So throughout this scene, Shakespeare sought to reveal, what? 30 seconds thinking time. So don't write anything just yet. 30 seconds thinking time. Okay, stop there then. What is Shakespeare trying to reveal by showing us those fears in Banquo? Imogen. Brilliant, is guilt. How do you know? Why, why is he feeling guilty or how can we tell that he's feeling guilty at this point? Through the language that Shakespeare uses. Okay. Can you add to that answer at all, Rosie? Well, he shows guilt by the fact that he's rethinking this over and over again and that it's kind of an immovable thought. Whereas if he didn't feel that guilt, it would probably pass over his head quite easily. Right, brilliant. So he's unable to dismiss it, isn't he, and move on from it. Who does dismiss it? Who have we already seen dismiss that guilt and move on? Lexi, who was more able to do that? Brilliant. So immediately after the murders, she basically tells him to pull himself together. She moves on quite quickly. So throughout the scene, Shakespeare sort of reveals, so we've got our analytical verb in here. You are very welcome to add another one in if you would like to. We want to finish that sentence with something about the destructive power of guilt. I'm going to give you now one minute, one carefully crafted sentence in that box, please. Off you go. Okay, and pen down, please. I'm going to just seal the yours for a minute. So, pens down and track in the front for me, please. 
So we've got Imogen's answer on here. So Imogen has said, throughout this scene, Shakespeare sought to reveal the overwhelming thoughts which come along with guilt. She's not wrong, is she? But how can we take this one from good to great? I want us to try and add in a second analytical verb. What is it in here that Shakespeare is trying to demonstrate to his contemporary audience, his audience at the time, that they absolutely should not, must not do? So the, over, the overbearing thoughts which come along with guilt. What's he guilty about, Kieran? What's he done? <coughs> He's committed regicide. Right, he has committed regicide. Why is that such a massive problem, Seren? I'm not sure. Lexi, help her out. Why is regicide the most heinous, the worst crime he could possibly commit? Because people believe that the king was chosen by God. Right, absolutely brilliant. People believe that the king was chosen by God. What's that called, Georgina? Um, Can you remember? Is it something to do with natural order? It is something to do with the natural is order. You're absolutely right. right. Fantastic. It's divine right of kings is the idea that the king is chosen by God. And that puts him at the top of the natural order. So could we add on to Imogen's, to take it from good to great, could we add on something about the natural order? Throughout this scene, Shakespeare sought to reveal the overwhelming thoughts, or the overbearing thoughts, sorry, which come along with guilt. And to warn against what? Subverting the natural order. Absolutely brilliant. So, and to warn against subverting the natural order. You've got 10 seconds to use your green pen to add to yours. Can you get a second analytical verb into yours? And can you develop your comment on Shakespeare's message? Finally, using the input up to this point, students will engage in independent practice in the form of either a redraft or a similar task. As with any new initiative, there were tweaks and reviews that still continue, and our current model is by no means the finished product. What it has done, though, is make us focus more explicitly on what we want students to get from feedback. Staff are more focused on identifying small but high leverage steps that will drive improvement, it's made it clearer to students what good looks like and how to bridge the gap between where they are and where they need to be. And it has moved the focus of feedback from passivity to active engagement, changing the way that both staff and students approach future tasks. I hope you found this video useful. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to our channel. I look forward to seeing you soon.